listening to the sounds of the morning, our bodies shuffling and shifting as we find our sitting positions, sneezing, clearing the throat, sound of my voice. We receive the sounds of the world here in this space of awareness. The world happens here in our minds. This is where we receive, where we know, where we experience the world, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching. This is where the world is felt, is known. This might be particularly clear here in the environment of the retreat center at Amravati. But just because the perception of the body getting into a car and driving out of the gate moving down the roads, through the streets, an airport. Just because the patterns of perception change doesn't mean that the world is happening anywhere else. The world of the M25, the London Underground, the road to Northampton, to Wales, New Jersey, Sri Lanka. The shape of an aeroplane, the sounds of the crowd around us. The open sky, the road beneath us. Where else does it happen? Where else is it known? Whether the body is sitting still or the body is perceived as moving through space, traveling along a road, across a sea, through a sky. Where else does it happen? Where else is it known? But this very mind, in this awareness, there's the flow. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thought, feeling, memory, choice, moods, like and dislike, approval, disapproval, happiness, unhappiness. That flow happens here, takes shape, does its thing within the space of this mind. So even though there's the perception of this is the last day of the retreat and I have to go off to my place, to my home, continue my travels, there's the perception of somebody going somewhere, but actually all of us are always here. This is described in the insights of Douglas Harding. The world happens in your mind. The world comes through us. We don't go anywhere. Every single one of us is always and has always been nowhere but here. Everywhere you've ever been was always the center of the universe. Without fail all the time. Wherever you were throughout your entire life, even as a baby, even in a coma, you were always here. The world happens here, is known here. A 
But when we per- perceive this this way, when we shift the perspective in this way, and is recognized, acknowledge that the world happens in this mind, then the heart taps into a profound fundamental stillness, that stillness of being which is apart from, transcendent of the world of space, of time, of past and future. What Lumpur Cha called still flowing water as the flow of perceptions, the perceptions of like and dislike, coming and going, movement and inactivity. And there's the stillness. The water is perfectly still insofar as that awareness is always here. There's nowhere for it to go. On the level of awareness, location does not apply. Your mind cannot be said to be anywhere. Here and there don't apply, really. The mind is unlocated. Three-dimensional space does not really apply in the world of the mind. It only has meaning in terms of, of the sense world, of rupa. When we contemplate nama, the mental realm, place, location, does not really apply. The world happens here. When we uh, contemplate and reflect in this way, there's a profound oceanic quality of peacefulness, stillness. There's nowhere to go. You're always here. This is a, a way that we can help to break the habits of becoming, the endless leaning into the next thing, the mind drawn by the pull of what's coming, that we want, that we don't want, that we are responsible for, that we're worried about. To remember, to recollect this quality of timeless, unlocated presence as a fundamental stillness stillness, timelessness of our own being that we can realize, we can draw upon, be informed by. There's nowhere to get to. You're here already. There's nobody going anywhere. It's just conditions of mind that are changing. When we recollect, reflect in this way, then we can let the world flow through us. The world of Amaravati Retreat Center, packing up our things, tidying our living space. The world of saying goodbyes, climbing into vehicles, walking across the fields. The footsteps are still known in the mind. The car seat is known in the mind, just as the the zafu and the zabuton. The sight of the the sky above the M25, the feeling of the other cars around us, the aroma of the London underground, comes, goes, changes. It all happens here. 
So as we relate, we uh, relate to experience, the flow of perception and mood. We never, we realize we never have to leave the retreat. The retreat is an internal seclusion, what is called jitta viveka, the seclusion of the heart. The attention is not being drawn out and getting lost in perceptions. It's not going out there, but stays in here, stays with the quality of, of knowing, with vijja. Undistracted, clear, receptive, present, perfectly peaceful. And the miraculous thing is that regardless of the complexity and vividness demanding nature of perception, this is always the case. No matter how loud and mobile the world gets, it is still just patterns of consciousness, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. Coming and going, changing. Therefore, we always have the capacity to, to see it, to know it in that way. Even if we forget, that capacity is always here. It can't go anywhere else. Because that's the reality of things. Even with perceptions of great agitation or personal responsibility, it's still... Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, mood, feeling, memory. Arising, taking shape, dissolving. It's all known in the same place. So if we're concerned about uh, sustaining the practice, sustaining the, the mood and mode of the retreat, sustaining the, the vision of Dhamma after the formal ending of the retreat time, then this is the most uh, accessible, practical way of keeping the retreat going. That the viveka, the retreat, is sustained internally. We keep the citta viveka alive through the attitude that we have, remembering, oh, this is just the world happening in my mind. And not in an abstracted or uh, <coughs> aversive way, coming from a place of rejection or fearfulness or vibhava tanha, but awakening to the natural separation that there is between the awareness, between the knowing and the, the patterns of perception. And Puchao would say it's like oil and water in a bottle together. When our lives are agitated and busy, the mind is caught up in identification with the body, identification with feeling, with perceptions, mental formations, identifying with consciousness. All the rupupadana kando, vedanupadana kando. Then it's like the oil and the water are shaken up together. The bottle is agitated, and the oil and the water seem to be a single element. seems to be me feeling, my body, I think, I taste, I see, I'm doing. I like, I dislike. But when we put the bottle down, then you don't have to do anything to make the water and the oil separate, because their natures are different. They separate out on their own. You don't have to do anything. 
awareness, the quality of knowing, vicha, is naturally unentangled in the perceptions, thoughts, feelings, moods that are known. They separate out. You don't have to do anything to make it happen. There's a natural, intrinsic unentanglement. And if we just put the bottle down, then the, the knowing and the world, thoughts and feelings, perceptions, and gently and steadily separate out from each other. The stillness is known within which the world is happening. The space within which the world is perceived and received is apparent. This is the, the portable viveka, the portable retreat. And one of the most helpful ways of recollecting, sustaining this, is to develop the inner listening, listening to the inner sound, the continuous, silvery, subtle presence of the, the nada sound, which also is always here, this inner vibration, ever-present. Whether we're here in the shrine room at Amravati, whether we're on the M25 or the underground, back in the open plan office, even next to the pneumatic drill, a chainsaw, even in the midst of a family argument, it's still here. And we can listen, be reminded, oh yes, it's just the world. This is the sound of our dear world doing its thing. And when we listen, listen to the nada sound, it can be the perfect catalyst for that quality of recollection. It's its own attributes help us to remember the timelessness, the spaciousness, stillness of being, the stillness, spaciousness of awareness that is the environment, the container for all experience. So this isn't like creating a, a sort of isolated internal bubble that we go and inhabit and insulate ourselves from, from the, the nasty world or the, the family discussion. It's not a hideaway. When there is this citta viveka, this internal seclusion, there's still a perfect attunement to the things of the world, to our actions, our, the people we're with, the world around us, our breath, our body, as an attunement, a participation, but it's completely unentangled, unburdened. The heart is fully with the world, attuned to the, the reality, the suchness of all things, but is simultaneously transcendent, unentangled, unidentified with all things. It knows the emptiness, the sunya, sunyata, the emptiness of all things. So there's a, a participating, an engagement that's sincere, genuine, natural, and a transcendence, an unentanglement, an easefulness. And even though these might seem to be contradictory, 
the mysterious truth is that uh, the middle way, the mysterious middle, is the perfect blending and balancing of those qualities. Just as in the the word that the Buddha used to refer to himself, Tathagata, means both thus come, completely here, and thus gone, completely transcendent, completely here, present, attuned, attentive, completely gone unattached, un unentangled, transcendent. Perfectly mindful and concerned, attentive to the things of the world, yet unburdened, unconfused, unlimited, by the things of the world. This is the middle, the marvelous, mysterious middle way. <laughs> 